For the next 10 minutes, we're going to talk about William Osgood and his sawmill on the Powwow River Falls. Some historians, as Larry said, said he built the first ever sawmill uh, on the falls in 1641 and that it was a sawmill. But as Larry just said, a review of deeds by Steve Klomps raises questions about whether uh, it was the first mill in the falls, whether it was a sawmill and whether it was built in 1641 or maybe 1650. But these questions are so new that we're gonna leave those for a future program. As John said earlier, there's so much more to discover and learn. So why do we care about these sawmills on the early powwow or grist mills for that matter? Well, one reason is uh, these mills were the starting point for 300 years of industrial prosperity in Amesbury. There's also an engineering story here about putting these mills together. There's a business story, there's a profit motive, and it's a story about the people involved and their motivations. So for the next few minutes, we'll talk about the purpose of sawmills and how they worked, the importance of sawmills, the pretty exact Osgood mill location, how that mill came to be built there and how these sawmills brought prosperity to Amesbury. So the purpose of sawmills, I guess, might be obvious until you, uh, if you think about it, they converted logs um, into useful shapes such as beams, boards, and planks using water power. A few mills use wind power, but I think they were relatively rare in this area. Without sawmills, producing lumber was hard work. Colonists had to make crude boards with a process called riving. Riving was working your way along a log, splitting it with wedges and a mallet. If you wanted smoother planks, you used a pit saw. Two men pushed and pulled a two-handled saw, uh, two saw blade, and this is obviously back-breaking work. Men working with a pit saw could produce six or seven boards a day, so you can imagine how expensive these must have been. Even after all that work, however, the rived or sawn lumber still needed further shaping and smoothing with hand saws and planes before it could be used. The sawmill was simply a mechanized pit saw. They took that pit saw blade and put it in a four-sided frame called a sash. The sash is in a vertical track or channel so it can slide up and down, allowing the blade to cut. The sash moved the blade up and down about 120 strokes a minute, powered by an arm called the pitman arm, which you see here. It was connected to a crank on the water wheel. And you can imagine, you can guess at why it was called a pitman arm because it replaced the man in the pit for the pit saw. If uh, you want to look at another piece of the mechanism, there was also uh, levers and cranks that rotated to actually advance the log toward the saw blade so that it would cut, it moved about three eighths of an inch with every stroke of the saw blade. So the benefits of sawmills, obviously they saved labor, they increased efficiency. Uh, and th this was important because labor was scarce in the colonies and it was expensive. They also made lumber more abundant and it was much needed in the colonies for building houses, ships, fences, uh, anything that needed wood. And that was pretty much everything in those days. So it made necessities less expensive for the growing community that needed them for housing, building, and trade. And with the abundant timber in the nearby forests, there was money to be made. So that was about sawmills in general. Now we'll introduce you to William Osgood, who used this technology on the Powwow River Falls in what's now downtown Amesbury in 1641, or maybe it was 1650. So we've already oriented people to the uh, location of Amesbury, about 35 miles north of Boston. But if we go to downtown Amesbury today, 
the site of Oz Goods Mill is right here, um, just below the Main Street Bridge. Um, if you're familiar with downtown Amesbury, it's sort of behind the Sylvaticus Brewery, right on the banks of the river. Of course, there was nothing else there in 1641. Here's a view of what this site looks like today. Of course, the, both banks have been developed heavily, so it's not much to look at, but I'm guessing the riverbed didn't change much. Water flowing downward drops probably uh, 10 or 15 feet from the top of this image to the bottom. So Osgood had to make use of that drop in the water. Here's a sketch of what, how Osgood's mill might have looked. Uh, a wooden sluice or flume carried water from the high location on the falls and directed it onto a water wheel where it would turn the wheel powering the machinery and saw blade inside the building, which we saw in the earlier slide. The building that I showed in the previous slide looked more like a grist mill because historians have speculated that most sawmills were open on two or three sides. So the sawmill might have looked more like this than the building in the previous slide. So why did he choose that spot? Well, obviously there was the steep natural fall in the water level, but also it was close to tidewater. So transportation was nearby. And then from there, he could access the Merrimack River and the rest of the world quite easily. Here, this slide shows you the location in comparison to Tidewater. And it's only 800 feet from the site of Osgood's Mill here down to the Tidewater. So it was easy for him to bring lumber down to that location or bring materials up to his sawmill for processing. This area where it says Tidewater uh, was also called Osgood's Landing. So that all fits in with this scenario. It's likely too, of course, that lumber and logs were carried by land uh, in addition to using water transportation. Here's the start of the simple water route from Osgood's Mill to the rest of the world. It's shown on an 1825 Hales map. The two miles of flat brackish water uh, between the Powwow Falls and the Merrimack River made it an easy trip and in fact made the, uh, the Powwow River uh, like an access ramp on a busy interstate highway. From the mouth of the Powwow to the Atlantic was a mere seven miles. So from the base of the Powwow Falls, a few feet from Osgood's Mill, you could load your product onto a boat and send it anywhere in the civilized world in the 1600s. You could also receive raw materials and supplies the same way. So how did the mill get built there? Well, it took some, uh, it took some organizing. The town leaders knew they had a valuable resource, the falls, available to develop for the benefit of the town. Some historians say the settlers of Salisbury and today's Amesbury came here because they knew about the falls, they, but they needed a plan to develop this resource. They had one by 1641. Somehow they knew about William Osgood, who lived across the Merrimack River in Newbury. As a millwright, he knew how to build mills. So Salisbury leaders decided to recruit Osgood with his millwright and carpentry skills and entice him to move across the Merrimack to start a mill going on the powwow. The proposal seems like a good one, an offer he couldn't refuse. 60 acres of land, and protection for competition, as long as the mill is sufficiently maintained to supply the entire town. His family must have said, you'd be crazy to turn this down. So Osgood took the offer, either in 1641 or 1650 and established his sawmill business. He took a risk. How could he be sure of success? As with any successful business, he had to pay attention to the profit, a difference between his revenue and his expensive. Revenue, of course, came from the sale of lumber or bartering it for things he needed or wanted. He also had his expenses, as you'd expect. And here's a list of a few of them. You may be able to think of others. But by the end of each season or year, it's likely that Osgood was making money. Otherwise, why would he have continued his operation? 
Osgood's mill and other mills brought prosperity. Demand for lumber and other wood products was great. By 1656, in fact, the town issued a grant for a second sawmill to be built by Macy and Currier near Osgood's mill. So Osgood must have had more demand than he could satisfy. All this success and wealth helped change the harsh Puritan culture of the time too, according to one historian. By 1700, worldly rewards like wealth from sawmills made the old Puritan doctrine of self-denial seem less compelling. Historian Richard Candy discovered that men with major interests in sawmills in Massachusetts Bay were in the upper 5% of the wealthiest men. Even those with smaller interests were up in the 25% area. Mills elevated several men to the elite of provincial society. The desire for success and wealth apparently drew others to the Powwow Falls. Multiple sawmills would be operating almost side by side by the late 1700s. Many other types of mills were there too. Amesbury had been established as an industrial center. So here's what Osgood started in industrialized Amesbury in 1792, about 150 years after Osgood built his mill. The stars indicate the five sawmills that existed in 1792. Here's where Osgood's mill was, and you'll see there are four others on this map by Mike Prendergast. These included grist mills, oil mills, fulling mills, a snuff mill, and an iron works. Well, thank you for your attention. <laughs>